The march to Miami began in San Diego with some familiar faces in unfamiliar places. 11-year assistant Don McCafferty was starting his first season as head coach. 15-year quarterback John Unitas was starting his first game in the AFC. And 10-year halfback Tom Maddy was striving to repeat as the league leader in combined rushing and receiving yardage. But Maddy was injured, and one familiar face was lost for the season. The Baltimore defense, with Mike Curtis now established in the middle and a rededicated Bubba Smith crashing from outside, dominated quarterback John Hadle and the San Diego offense. Since Super Bowl III, the Colts had become a young team again, averaging only 25 years of age. The top runner was suddenly a rookie, a 215-pound Texas Bull named Norm Boulash. From the Pittsburgh Steelers came the flash and dash of number 87, outside man Roy Jefferson. In field goal situations, another new man was called upon, rookie Jim O'Brien. In his first game, trailing by one point with less than a minute to play, O'Brien was to feel just a sampling of things to come. O'Brien's field goal beat the Chargers 16 to 14. In San Diego, opening day brought a fresh call for the home team to charge out of a rut cut by four straight third place seasons. Once again, the Chargers hope to break the Western Division dominance of Oakland and Kansas City. But this time, the challenge was offered by a new face. John Unitas and his Colts were opening their American Conference history with some newness of their own. Don McCafferty was now calling the shots after 19 years as a Baltimore assistant. The two teams from what had been two leagues finalized the merger immediately as the Colts welcomed Gary Garrison and the Chargers to the NFL. The San Diego defense was just as gracious as they greeted Roy Jefferson and the Colts to the American Conference. This start set the mood of the day as defense dominated for the entire first half. Number 20, Jerry Logan thwarted a Charger threat with a fumble recovery, and then the Colts were turned back as number 82, Steve DeLong, scrambled a United screen pass. For more than one half, the combined offensive output of both teams was only three points. In this rugged defensive battle, each team struggled, sweated, and waited for a break. Baltimore's came on a punt fielded by rookie Ron Jardine, number 30. Jardine's dash set up a cold touchdown, but then San Diego flashed back with equal suddenness. The Charger fire was provided by a John Hadel shot to number 27, Gary Garrison. Garrison's 65-yard streak split open the tight, cold defense, and Hadel quickly went to work to shatter it completely. But the cold slammed the door shut as quickly as it had opened. Unitas had no more luck in exploiting the sudden cold advantage as both defenses again took control of the game. 
the Charger attack wilted under the pass rush led by number 78, Bubba Smith. And each time the Colt offense appeared ready to muster a bit of momentum, San Diego would steal it away. The game reverted to its first half pattern as neither team could gain leverage and the battle went back to the inhabitants of the trench. As physically difficult as this type of game is for the player, it is equally as torturous on the coach. San Diego's Charlie Waller saw the time slipping away as he searched for a means to restore his team's offensive punch. The answer turned out to be an increasingly familiar one for the Chargers. Go to Garrison. Garrison's romp gave San Diego a 14-13 lead with less than five minutes remaining. All they had to do was hang on. But John Unitas was leading last-minute cold drives before the Chargers were founded. And with his matchless precision, he brought his team back upfield. He brought his team back, and with 56 seconds remaining, rookie place kicker Jim O'Brien was given his NFL baptism of fire. O'Brien proved up to the pressure of his new role. The Colts' 16-14 victory opened a new era and a new conference. And after 19 years in the wings, Don McCafferty was a winner in his first time out. The Monday night home opener and the first official meeting with the super champions from Kansas City. A national television audience watched in fascination as superhero Len Dawson firebombed the Colt zones with four touchdown passes. When the Colts had the ball, everywhere Unitas looked, there was a nightmare waiting to turn defense into offense. The world champions outmanned the Colts in every phase of the game. And when it was all over, a nationwide jury of television viewers had written off the Colts for another year. In Boston, Johnny Unitas and the Baltimore Colts must have thought they'd dropped in on a rerun of Samson and Delilah. In addition to mod hairstyles, the Patriots also had a quarterback known for getting himself into and out of hairy situations. But Joe Caff stayed safely on the sidelines, while number 17, Mike Tolliver, took the punishment meted out by Baltimore's defensive end, Billy Newsom, number 81. Colt starter Earl Morrill, number 15, gave his team an early lead as he hit Eddie Hinton in the end zone. But the Patriots came back fast. Tolliver hit number 34, Ron Sellers, who made another of his great catches, catches that are becoming an every game occurrence for the talented second year man. as the Patriots closed in, the old master warmed up on the sidelines. Boston's second field goal made it 7-6, and the Colts needed a fireman. The aroused Patriot defense was burning Earl Morrill repeatedly. And in the end, it was Johnny Unitas who came in and doused the Patriots' flame on a 55-yard pass to number 87, Roy Jefferson, to make the final score Colts 14, Patriots 6. In Houston's Astrodome, a new rival made its first appearance. Though still led by over-reliable number 19, the Colts can no longer steamroll through their schedule. For the past year, the Colts have been testing new talent like number 40, Jack Maitland, a rookie from Williams College. 
Maitland and former Pittsburgh receiver Roy Jefferson, number 87, gave the Colts an early two touchdown lead over the Oilers. Houston quarterback Charlie Johnson brought the Oilers back with short passes to number 89, tight end Alvin Reed. In the third quarter, Roy Hopkins' short touchdown burst brought the Oilers to within three points. In the fourth quarter, former Dallas and Cleveland quarterback Jerry Rome, number 17, flipped a pass to number 24, Mike Richardson, which set up the go-ahead points for the Oilers. But in the end, it was old reliable John Unitas, who drove the Colts 80 yards and hit five consecutive passes, including the game winner to Roy Jefferson with only 46 seconds left. For the third time in four games, John Unitas had pulled a doubtful decision into the win column for the Colts, and each time a receiver named Roy Jefferson had played the key role. The Colts opened with two tight ends, two wide receivers, and one back, determined to pass their way to victory. And on the game's first play, John Unitas and John Mackey combined for a big start to one of the wildest first quarters ever seen. Unitas immediately discovered his game plan to be correct. The Jets' defense against the rush is and has always been excellent. And on the following three plays, number 60, linebacker Larry Grantham, lineman Verlin Biggs, and John Elliott stopped the Colts' running game cold. On fourth and six, rookie Jim O'Brien made it 3-0 with a 28-yard field goal. The Colts would run the ball only six more times in the half. Weeb Eubank had the same exact game plan, pass. Where Unitas succeeded, Namath, on his first attempt, met disaster. Throwing against one of the best zone secondaries in football, Namath was intercepted by number 20, safety Jerry Logan, and Logan easily took it into the end zone. On a repeat, we see that Namath's pass was deflected by Bubba Smith right into Logan's hands. Colts 10, Jets nothing. The Jets' second series would be epitomized by the kickoff return as number 40, Mike Battle, had his bell rung. Namath overthrew Maynard three straight times and Baltimore got the ball again. Again, it took Unitas five plays to score. First, he went to Eddie Hinton, number 33, the second-year man from Oklahoma, who has displaced Jimmy Orr. Hinton's deep post gained 32 yards. Then Unitas used one of his two tight ends on a quick out. Tom Mitchell, number 84, took the pass, broke a tackle by number 51, Ralph Baker, and went to the Jets' 15. Two plays later, Mitchell ran the same pattern to the other side and was no match for the linebacker covering him. Colt 17, Jets nothing with 10 minutes left in the first quarter. Took it to the nine. But on second down, a pass to setback Lee White was broken up. But he couldn't resist Don Maynard, so he faded back with plenty of time and fired the ball for the end zone, right into the hands of Jerry Logan. On a repeat, we can see Maynard was again double covered, and Logan's perfectly timed theft closed out with a flourish, a frenetic first quarter. The Colts ahead, 17 to three. We'll be right back with more exciting action on the NFL Game of the Week. 
With the Colts ahead by 14, United surprisingly continued to pass. On the screen to number 36, rookie Norm Boulash, watch the Jets' number 21, rookie Steve Tannen, play off his blocker and stop Boulash, who had hopes of a long gainer. Primarily because his running game is somewhat limited. Tom Matty is injured, and Boulash and Jack Maitland are rookies. Then Johnny Unitas called a reverse by receiver Roy Jefferson. And with perfect ball handling by everyone, it worked for another first down to the Jets 15. His short passing game was okay, but he couldn't hit the long one. He could not fault his line, which was giving him ample time. Rather, Joe Willie's receivers just couldn't clear their defenders. And Joe Willie, who hadn't faced that many zones, was not able to find the open slots in the coverage used by the Colts' backs and linebackers. So Jim Turner would try to salvage something. But even he was below par. And Jim Duncan brought his short attempted three-pointer back 28 yards. to the locker room. Colts 20, Jets 5. The 20 to 5 score survived only seven seconds into the second half. When on the first play from scrimmage, linebacker Bob Grant stepped in front of a Namath pass at the New York 27 and scored. The placement was low, but Baltimore now led 26 to 5 of the week. With a minute and a half left in the third period and the Colts ahead by a touchdown, Jim Duncan took a kickoff at his own five and brought it back 43 yards to give the Colts great field position. John Unitas resisted the temptation of a passing duel with Namath and for the rest of the game stayed on the ground. Sam Haverlack was running well and Baltimore moved into Jets territory. But at the beginning of the fourth quarter on a third down play, Haverlack was just short of a first down, and Baltimore kicked a field goal to increase their lead to 10 points, 29 to 19. For New York, Namath went deep for Maynard, who was behind his defender. But Jim Duncan went high to make a difficult interception and returned at 30 yards. The Colts could do nothing and gave the ball back to New York, but time was running out for the Jets. Baltimore had gotten their revenge and now stood atop the American Conference's Eastern Division, tied with Miami for first place. Each team has a 4-1 record. The Jets dropped three games behind the Colts. They've won only one of five games, and their hopes for qualifying for the playoffs are virtually buried. In this game, the Super Bowl revisited. Baltimore proved to the Jets that the past cannot be recaptured. Baltimore had won 29 to 22. The In Baltimore, the surging Colt defense, led by number 81, rookie Billy Newsom, decapitated the Boston Patriot offense. For the second straight week, the Joe Cap led Patriots could not put a touchdown on the board. Cap was intercepted four times, and the Boston rushing game was limited to 45 yards. In the meantime, the venerable John Unitas was teaching a course in cool play calling and complete passes to old toughs like John Mackey. When Mackey was tied up, rookie Jack Maitland caught it from the old master. And just to prove what proud professionals the Baltimore Colts are, 
When this pass to Roy Jefferson was called back for holding, Unitas did it again with Jefferson until everybody got it right. And just for luck, he did it one more time with his old sidekick, Jimmy Orr. And Unitas and the Colts undid the Patriots 27-3. Back home the next week, the Colts turned their wrath to another guy named Joe. The last time they faced him, Joe Cap threw for seven touchdowns. This time, Cap himself was touched down seven times. All the touchdowns were handled by the master himself. One to the rookie runner from Williams, Jack Maitland. One to 13-year veteran Jimmy Orr. And one to the man who is currently the principal tenant of Oarsville, Roy Jefferson. The Colts romped past Boston 27-3 and prepared to welcome former coach Don Shula and his fast-rising Miami Dolphins for the kind of match no one wanted to miss. In the first quarter, Ron Gardeen got a flying start, took a punt on the dead run, and flashed 80 yards to complete the longest punt return of the pro season. Not to be outdone, Jim Duncan returned to kickoff 99 yards, the longest play of the AFC season, on two of the longest legs. The Miami defense fared no better against John Unitas and the Baltimore offense. The Colts rolled on to their fifth consecutive victory as they walloped Miami 35 to nothing and opened up a two-game lead over the second-place Dolphins in the AFC East. John Unitas is one of the best play callers in football. And in the first half of the season, innovative coach Don McCafferty always seemed to have a tricky new wrinkle ready for Unitas to call at the moment least expected. To open the second half of the season, McCafferty had prepared for the Green Bay Packers and another national television audience a few of the trickiest wrinkles of all. Jerry Hill slogged into the mud and murk of the Green Bay end zone, and the Colts were a winner for the sixth straight time. In preparation for John Unitas and the Baltimore Colts, the Buffalo Bills defense played monkey in the middle. Oddly enough, this strategy carried over to the game itself as the Bills had the once beaten Colts going backwards. Led by rookie quarterback Dennis Shaw and the bullish thrusts of mammoth Wayne Patrick, Buffalo's offense dominated the cold defense, one of the stingiest in all of football. Shaw, a prominent contender for Rookie of the Year, threw two touchdown passes. One going to flashy Haven Moses, the other to tiny Marlon Briscoe, the AFC's leading receiver. The two scores gave Buffalo a surprising 14 to nothing lead and even the scoreboard blinked in disbelief. Although cold receivers cleared their defenders easily, the field at times was just one yard too short. Finally, the old master managed a score. He used both his tight ends, Tom Mitchell, number 84, and John Mackey, number 88, to split the Bills' deep defense for a touchdown. Baltimore tied the game at 14-all when Eddie Hinton outflanked the Bills on a reverse.
The Colts later added a Jim O'Brien field goal and led 17-14 late in the final quarter. With just minutes remaining, Shaw drove Buffalo to the Colts' 28-yard line. From there, Grant Guthrie kicked a 36-yard field goal to tie the game at 17-17 with just one minute to play. John Unitas' attempt to rally Baltimore was blunted by an interception by Pete Richardson, who ended up at the Bills' 49-yard line. With just two seconds left, Grant Guthrie lined up his sights on a haunted house and attempted a 58-yard field goal that would enshrine his foot in the Tom Dempsey Hall of Fame. However, Guthrie's try was woefully short, and Jim Duncan almost sneaked through a crease for a touchdown. Though more than two touchdown underdogs, the Bills came out of Baltimore with a tie and a moral victory. An AFC Eastern Division game was played in more pleasant weather. The temperature in Miami was 70 degrees higher than in Minnesota as the first place Colts met the second place Dolphins with coach Don Shula seeking revenge. The Colts started as impressively as they had in the team's first meeting, a 35-0 Baltimore win. Jim Duncan took the opening kickoff 57 yards to set up a field goal. The Colt defense continued their onslaught on Bob Greasy, just as it had three weeks before. Then came the play that turned the momentum around. Jake Scott raced 77 yards with a punt to start the ball rolling. Bob Greasy rolled it a little farther when he went 15 yards on a quarterback draw. And Paul Warfield rolled it farther yet on a 27-yard touchdown pass reception to put Miami in front 21-3. But Johnny Unitas wasn't finished, and his passes began hitting their mark. Unitas threw two touchdown passes as the Colts fought back. One was on a four-yard flip to Roy Jefferson, and the other was a two-yard pop to Tom Mitchell. Miami's clinching touchdown came on a 51-yard catch and run greasy to Carl Noonan. Despite the loss, the Colts held on to first place. But Shula's Dolphins had beaten his ex-pupils 34-17 in the rematch with a clutch game that kept Miami in the postseason playoff picture. Home again, the gloom continued. John Unitas got off to one of his roughest starts as his old friends, the Chicago Bears, came up with five interceptions, three of them setting up scores in the first seven minutes. 
but Unitas kept firing. A catch by Sam Haverlack set up one touchdown. A one-hand grab by Eddie Hinton set up another. And a Roy Jefferson stretch brought the Colts within three. In the final minutes, pro football's all-time quarterback found John Mackey, pro football's all-time tight end, and three weeks of frustration had finally ended, 21 to 20. The next week, a 30-mile-per-hour wind ripped apart the Baltimore Dirt Bowl. But even this could not deter the Colts' 50th consecutive home sellout. The usual 60,000-plus watched the Philadelphia Eagles battle fruitlessly against the elements and the Colts' resourceful defense. Throwing to receivers he sometimes could barely see, John Unitas led the Colts to within one game of a division title. In Buffalo's War Memorial Stadium in the season's 13th week, John Unitas led the Colts across the tundra toward Miami. When Norm Boulash powered through the Bills and into the end zone for the winning touchdown, the Colts had their 10th victory, 20 to 14, and were grateful to escape from Buffalo with the AFC's Eastern Division title. Returning hero John Unitas started the final game of the regular season, but this was to be Earl Morrill's day against his old tormentors, the New York Jets. In three quarters of a game, Morrill passed for 348 yards, four touchdowns, and a personally satisfying 35 to 20 victory. The leather-tough Colt defense, led by the animalistic stalking of middleman Mike Curtis, seemed even tougher against the Jets. When Ted Hendricks blocked a punt and recovered it for a touchdown, the Colts' victory was assured, and with it, an 11-2-1 record, best in the AFC. This victory seemed to symbolize the 10 victories which preceded it, for every part of the team functioned nearly to perfection and proved itself ultimately tuned for the final drive to the Super Bowl. The Baltimore Colts tuned up for the playoffs by facing their old Super Bowl foes, the New York Jets. Number 18, Al Woodall, got the Jets on the board first with this bullet to rookie Richard Castor. Earl Morrill found number 33, Eddie Hinton, wide open for the equalizer. But number 81, Jerry Philbin, dislocated this Morrill aerial, and linebacker Larry Grantham put the Jets in the lead late in the first half. But Morrill brought the poised Colts right back before the end of the half, hitting number 87, Roy Jefferson, for a long game. Working on the left side of the Jets' secondary, he speared Roy Jefferson three times. Then he again sprung Hinton on the opposite side to complete the drive. In the third period, the old pro, Earl Morrill, continued his mischief in the Jets' secondary. Number 84, Tom Mitchell, made this good grab. Old pro Jimmy Orr did his thing once more for the Baltimore Colts and gracefully faded into the evening shadows of a great career, giving way to maturing stars like number 27, Ray Perkins.
The Colts' last score came when number 83, Ted Hendricks, blocked this punt and recovered for six more points. The Baltimore Colts are more than a team. They are a tradition as the Jets keep learning. This time, 35 to 20, Baltimore. On a cold and windy day after Christmas in Baltimore, the AFC's Eastern Division champion Baltimore Colts and their rookie coach were to begin their first postseason game since that black day in Miami two years before. They were finally to begin what they all had worked for, the playoffs, the chance to meet the red-hot Central Division champion Cincinnati Bengals of Paul Brown. Winners of seven straight, but winners no more. The aggressive Colt defense shut out the Bengals, and Norm Boulash ate up the clock with 25 carries worth 116 yards, his best day as a pro. The Colts won 17 to nothing and earned the right to meet the miracle makers from Oakland in the AFC championship game. America in pro football's number one offense could not penetrate the Baltimore defense in the game's early stages. They were throttled on the ground and inept in the air. Oakland could manage but six plays and only one completion in the first quarter. A six-yard outlet pass to fullback Hewitt Dixon as the Raiders were twice forced to surrender the ball without a first down. Number of talented receivers. Number 88, tight end John Mackey and wide receivers Roy Jefferson, number 87, Eddie Hinton, number 33, and Ray Perkins, number 27. When things got tough, Unitas went after the first down on his own and got it. But when he had driven the Colts to the Oakland Four, the Raiders finally stopped Unitas and brought about a field goal attempt by young Jim O'Brien. O'Brien's field goal gave Baltimore a three to nothing lead at the end of the first quarter. wide open Eddie Hinton, who caught the ball over his shoulder and made his way to the Oakland two-yard line. On the next play, Norm Boulash followed Tom Nowatzki into the end zone, and suddenly the Colts led 10 to nothing down pass to Eddie Hinton. In slow motion, Hinton's act appears ready for Ringling center ring. Behind great protection, Unitas again went for Hinton, who made another clutch catch for another first down. But for the third time in the game, an easy cold touchdown got away, as a perfect pass dropped directly between the hands of Roy Jefferson. Jim O'Brien was again called in to salvage the drive. The score was untied at 13 to 10, but the Colts were not satisfied. Offense again, John Unitas immediately started to drive for more points and more breathing room. The 
In crucial third and short yardage situations, Unitas relied on the running and blocking of Tom Nowatzki. And the tough young rookie from Texas Christian, Norm Bulash. The old Statue of Liberty play with Norm Boulash carrying took care of the final 11 yards to the Oakland goal. From the end zone camera, we can see that the Colts blocked the play about as well as a team can block. Oh, to be a rookie scoring his second touchdown in a championship game. Tonight has came up with the play of the day for the Colts. Cornerback Nehemiah Wilson sent in as a fifth defensive back to cover Perkins, and suddenly the Colts had regained their 10 point lead 27 to 17. <laughs> Linebacker Ray May, 35 yards deep in the zone. And so on that clear, sparkling January day in Baltimore's Dirt Bowl. The Colts had won the first championship of the new American Football Conference. And in so doing, they had defeated Pro Football's miracle team. A team whose record over the past four years had been the best in pro football. To throw early in the second quarter. His pass bounced off the intended receiver, Ed Hinton, then was tipped by the Cowboys' Mel Renfro, and then caught by the Colts' John Mackey, who raced 75 yards to a touchdown. The Cowboys protested the play, claiming Renfro never touched the ball. If he had not touched it, the score would have been nullified. Passes can't be tipped from one offensive man to another unless a defender touches the ball in between. First time in the game, the Colt offense sees the initiative. Morrill replaced the injured John Unitas at quarterback and brought with him a hard-born determination to succeed where he once had failed. In 1968, Morrill led the Colts to Super Bowl III. And when he crumbled beneath the charge of the New York Jets, he was called a sunshine soldier. But today, he was a sturdy commander, and his experienced arm was the only consistent element in the Colt attack. Twice in the fourth period, Morrill moved Baltimore into scoring positions, but both times the Cowboy defense denied the Colts a touchdown. Chuck Howley ended one drive with an interception in the end zone. The other drive ended with the most unusual play of the afternoon. Morrill handed to Sam Haverlack, who completed a pass to Hinton. Cornell Green ripped the ball loose, but neither team could recover it before it rolled out of the end zone. The officials ruled the play a touchback and awarded the Cowboys the ball on their own 20. 
disrupted the pattern. Haralak threw instead for John Mackey, but Ed Hinton caught it. When Cornell Green swiped the ball from Hinton's hands, neither team could recover it. intended for Walt Garrison was deflected into the hands of the Colt safety Rick Volk. Tom Nowatzki powered into the end zone and Super Bowl V was a tie game. Cowboys did not break under the pressure, but they bent. A pass from Craig Morton bounced off the fingertips of Dan Reeves and was intercepted by Mike Curtis. Once again, and for the last time, the relentless Colt defense shaped the character of Super Bowl V. Curtis returned the ball to the Dallas 28 and put the Colts in range of a field goal. Tell them all not to set until you tell them to set. And if they overload one side, give a man over right or man over left. Nobody get set until I holler set. All right, got it now. Tell them all Four when you come in. Let the fullback. Let's hurry. 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 let us hurry let us hurry let us hurry let us the world championship of professional football would be settled in one final play. Come on. Come on, baby. Come on. Please, please, please. All the money, all the glory, and all that counts in pro football rode on the right foot of rookie Jim O'Brien. January 17, 1971, there came into Miami's Orange Bowl a team which the nation had counted out in the season's second week, a team which had defied the experts. The Baltimore Colts had returned to the Super Bowl. At first, John Unitas had bad luck against the Dallas defense. And then his luck changed. But finally, Dallas crushed Unitas with a doomsday blow to the midsection.
Earl Morrill took over at quarterback and immediately began to move the ball against the Cowboys. Behind by seven points, the Colts' crazy quilt offense moved up and down the field, but was unable to score the tying touchdown. Finally, a fourth quarter Craig Morton pass was deflected to Rick Volk, who set up a tie at 13-13. But it was what followed that decided the game. Dallas, a second down, 35 yards to go. Morton being chased by Bubba Smith. And low, intercepted by Mike Curtis. Mike Curtis intercepts, and Baltimore has a chance now to win it. Baltimore has the ball on the Dallas 28. Here comes O'Brien. Nine seconds, young Jim O'Brien, a rookie. And the kick is up, the kick is good! Jim O'Brien with five seconds! Jim O'Brien, with five seconds left, ended the pro season the same way he had begun it, as a hero. He was a hero, and will always be. But he was only one among many who made their team the world champion Baltimore Colts. <laughs> 